What's up everybody and welcome to Heresy Financial. Uh, if you're new to this channel, uh, on this channel we discuss uh, any financial news uh, in a way that is considered heresy to the financial establishment. Really what that means is that you're not going to hear the same old news repeated that you can find on CNBC or MSNBC or Fox News or some of these things, Yahoo and Finance, that uh, pretend like they're giving you uh, real financially educating news, but in reality they're just uh, spouting uh, the same things that everybody else is spouting. What I'll do on this channel is I will dig into what is actually happening behind the scenes, explain how the mechanics actually work in a way that is understandable even to those of us who don't have a, uh, a background in the financial industry. Uh, and that is coming from me, somebody who does have a background in the financial services industry. Uh, so I understand how these things work from a behind the scenes perspective. And so what I do on this channel is uh, uncover what's really going on, explain it in a way that makes sense, uh, and then uh, uh, in a way that is also actionable so that you can actually do something with it, understanding what's going on, you can better prepare yourself for the inevitable crash that is coming. Today's topic, we're gonna to be diving into bubbles. Uh, recently, if you are following any other financial news, it seems like everywhere you turn, there's another bubble. Uh, there's the uh, IPO bubble, there's the index fund bubble, the stock market bubble, the real estate bubble, the student loan bubble, the auto loan bubble, the real estate bubble, I might have already said real estate there, uh, government debt bond bubbles. It seems like there's bubbles everywhere we turn. So we're gonna dive in. Are there actually all these bubbles? Why is it that everything seems like it's a bubble? What does that mean? And um, what is uh, what does that mean for the future? Are we headed for a uh, massive popping of tons of bubbles? Let's dive in. All right, so like I said, today's topic is bubbles. So we're gonna kind of go through very quickly each of these uh, quote unquote bubbles that are being talked about in the financial news today, what that means for you, and uh, try and see if there's maybe a common cause or source behind all of this. Um, so the first one that's kind of the most obvious right now that people are talking about is the stock market. Everybody's saying the stock market is a bubble, especially focusing on index funds. There is a massive amount of money that is moved into passive index funds. I have made a video about that specifically already, so I'm not gonna go into the mechanics of that, but it does look as if that specifically index funds might be a bubble. Um, and uh, really what that does to the stock market is it causes volatility because with less players actively buying and selling, which indexing causes, um, you have more volatility because there's less money uh, moving in and out to actively try and find value. And so after, shortly after I released that video actually, uh, uh, the character Michael Burry from uh, uh, The Big Short, the movie that came out a few years ago, um, the, the guy in real life, I can't remember actually if it was Michael Burry or Steve Eisman, it was one of those, um, came out and talked about the exact same thing that I talked about in that video. So just wanna mention that, that I'm not uh, you know, kind of following along with what some of these other guys or some of these other news sources are talking about. Uh, I'm noticing this stuff, trying to tell you guys about it, and now it's being verified as more of the mainstream sources start to talk about it as well. Um, so it does look like that's a bubble and it's, uh, there is a lot of money in the stock market right now that seems like it should, uh, should be coming out of the stock market. And one of the reasons why it looks like there's too much money in the stock market right now that it's not, the stock market's not really falling as a result of selling like we think it should be uh, because we see uh, recession signs starting to turn over. We had the inverted yield curve recently. Um, we also had, uh, within the last week, we had the uh, ISM manufacturing indices come out and the numbers look really bad. Uh, specifically for manufacturing, it hasn't been that low in the US since 2009. 2009, that was on the heels of the Great Recession. That was on the heels of you know millions of people being laid off and the stock market being you know cut in half basically for its value. So we had a lot of things going on that led to those numbers being so bad. And right now, we apparently aren't in a recession yet. But numbers that are coming out on manufacturing specifically show that uh, we probably have already begun the recession and it's just started in manufacturing. Same thing globally, we're seeing in Sweden and Germany and China, the same things, factory output numbers looking dismal compared to recent history. 
And so uh, the stock market hasn't uh, reacted as severely to that as we think it should. It's just kind of dropped a little bit. Today, it's even rebounded a little bit. Uh, and the reason it's rebounded is because now the market is factoring in a rate cut again from the Fed, a 92% rate cut from the Fed uh, for this month. And if you wanna know how the market prices in an expected rate cut, um, it goes something like this. Imagine your favorite uh, grocery store uh, announces that next week uh, there will be a 50% sale on everything that they sell. Um, actually, grocery store is a bad example because you might need food. So let's say department store. You like buying clothes every once in a while and your favorite place to buy clothes says next week we're going to have a 50% sale on all of our clothes. How many of you are going to go there this week and load up on clothes? Nobody. If you know that it's going to cost you twice as much today as it will next week, you're going to wait till next week. But if you are in the store when they announce that, you're going to go up to the cash register and you're going to say, hey, you're already going to offer the sale next week. Why not just give me next week's price right now? I mean, like you, it's, I'm not going to buy it otherwise. And so the cashier might say, you know, sure, I mean, it's going to happen next week anyway, and you're not going to buy it today unless I offer that uh, price that we're definitely guaranteed to offer next week. So I'm just going to offer it right now. So that's how the market prices in expected rate cuts. If the whole entire uh, credit industry is expecting that rates are going to be lower uh, in October when the Fed is announcing whether there will be another rate cut, well, then the, the industry is gonna price that in already. So if they're expecting that the rate cut is gonna happen, they're gonna, just in expectation of that, they're gonna lower their rates across the industry. And that's why mortgage rates plummeted uh, again today because uh, they're expecting that the Fed is gonna lower rates. And so uh, expectations are priced in to the present. Expectations of the future are gonna be priced into the present. So because everybody is expecting the Fed to lower rates, well, the stock market went back up. And uh, part of that is because when the Fed lowers rates, that means money is easier to acquire, easy, cheap money, it, the, the debt is cheap servicing, that debt is cheap. And so that money first funnels its way in, into institutions and corporations that do things like stock buybacks. And so that uh, lifts the valuation of companies as their, you know, their debt becomes cheaper and what they do with that money that they borrow. Um, is uh, short-term beneficial to the company. So the stock market reacted positively. It's actually up for the day following this bad, um, this bad news about manufacturing. And uh, uh, today the, the news was the uh, services industry was bad. It wasn't, it's, it wasn't as bad as manufacturing numbers, but it was a lot worse than they were expecting. Um, and so even following on the heels of this bad information, now people are expecting, hey, the Fed's going to give us more money. The Fed's going to make it easier for us to get cheap money and debt. And so the stock market, boom, it went up from that. So uh, yes, it does look like there is at least somewhat of a bubble built into the stock market right now. The next one that uh, most people are familiar with is real estate. Uh, real estate prices are uh, kind of going up around the nation. They're near or above what they were prior to the Great Recession collapse of housing prices. And so especially millennials right now, there are a ton of people that are not buying houses right now. They're waiting on the sidelines with a ton of cash because they think, hey, eventually this will all come crashing down and we'll have a repeat of 10 years ago and I'll be able to buy something for really cheap. I've talked about this in other content before, the next time everything starts to crash down soon here, it's not gonna look like last time. There's a very good chance that due to all of the inflation, that prices are going to go up even as valuation goes down. And so people's dollars essentially will, will be the thing that becomes worth less, not the assets in terms of the dollar. I've put up other content about that, so you can go check that out and how that works, prices versus value. Um, but uh, uh, essentially, uh, cash is probably what's going to become worth less in this next downturn. Um, and uh, when you're waiting in cash to buy an asset like real estate, you might see the price of that real estate go up when we have our next, uh, our next crash. And so real estate is one of those things that looks like there's a bubble because with all of these people waiting to buy homes, you still see prices going up. Add that into the fact that mortgage uh, prices are going down because rates are going down and you still don't have the uptick in sales like you would expect for home purchases and home prices maintaining their values um, on average. 
uh, it looks like there's a, uh, a little bit of a bubble there in real estate pricing. Okay, the next bubble that people have been talking about a lot recently is the student loan bubble. Now, the student loan bubble is an interesting one uh, because um, it wasn't until fairly recently in history when we had college uh, tuition prices skyrocketing as much as they skyrocket today. Now, uh, with um, student loan, uh, the student loan bubble, what you see right now is uh, massive and massive, massive amounts of student debt, and it's starting to be defaulted on at growing faster and faster rates. Um, but you have these, you know, these, uh, all these students right now that have, are loaded up with tons of student debt. They're going into the workforce and they're either not able to find a, you know, the job that they want or the jobs that they want aren't able to pay them as much as they need to pay off that debt. And so they're either defaulting or they're applying for forgiveness. And that's why you have a lot of politicians right now talking about student loan forgiveness. Well, where did this problem start? It started because the government uh, started guaranteeing student loans. Loans. Uh, so prior to that, and I, I, I can't remember the exact year that they started doing this, uh, but uh, prior to that, uh, nobody would really loan to students. Students are not a, a very good person to loan to because they have no work history, they have no job, and they have no assets. And so loaning them money is a big risk. You would need to charge them a lot in interest. So loaning them money is not really a good business decision because the likelihood that they'll have to file bankruptcy and not be able to pay you back is fairly high compared to somebody who has assets, like a you know a, an adult who's been in the workforce for years or somebody who has a job with good income. And so a, a student isn't necessarily a um, you know a, a good loan candidate. But once this once the government comes in and guarantees that loan and says, hey, if the if the kid defaults, I'll back that up and I'll pay it instead. Well, all of a sudden, students become the most credit worthy borrowers there are in the industry, uh, and so you had tons of uh, of uh, banks and financial institutions lining up to loan students money because it's it's virtually guaranteed. The government will pay them pay, pay you back that money if the student doesn't. Well, colleges and universities aren't stupid. If the student could afford it last year when there, there was no debt available, and now that there's cheap debt available, we know the student can afford a higher price because they can pay what they paid last year plus whatever they can borrow this year. And so supply and demand drove up the price of college and university. And so you've seen prices of colleges and universities skyrocket over the last number of years because every single year they know that the students can just borrow more money to pay. It's a supply and demand issue. And students are lining up to, to do this because the money is cheap. They don't, they're young. They don't understand the financial ramifications of getting into debt at that young of an age and then not being able to find a job that can, you know, the, the return on investment isn't there. The ROI is extremely low on these student loans. They're going to spend the next however many years paying off this debt and applying for forgiveness. And so essentially you had uh, the, 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 the government by way of the Federal Reserve, because the Federal Reserve is, the, the government's not paying all this money out of pocket. There's deficits every single year. And so when the government spends more than it makes in taxes, it issues debt. It, it creates its own debt. It issues a treasury. And who buys these treasuries? The Federal Reserve by printing money. So the Federal Reserve prints dollars, buys that debt from the U.S. government, and that US, the U.S. government uh, used that debt, basically, that deficit that caused that debt, they used that to purchase those, uh, those defaulted student loans. And so you have the Federal Reserve printing money to finance, uh, basically, these uh, uh, massively inflated uh, tuition costs across the board. And so... You have the student loan bubble right now, uh, basically because there's a bunch of really cheap, guaranteed, easy money flowing there. And uh, this can't go on forever because pretty soon students are going to realize there is no ROI on a, on a degree. And students are already starting to realize that. And so you might see this start to topple over, especially if the recession hits pretty quickly here. That'll start to reverse itself. That effect will reverse itself. And so this student loan bubble that we see uh, will start to kind of topple down on itself. All right, the next uh, bubble that we've seen, and it's not really talked about a lot, but it's auto loans. And it made news, I don't know, it was probably six months or a year ago now when, uh, uh, when CNBC was doing a couple articles on this. But um, auto loans, the default rate has started to skyrocket in at a rate that hasn't been seen in at least 10 years. Um, and this is particularly um, 
a particularly bad sign for the economy because uh, if you let's say you have you're even if you're single or if you have a family whatever your situation is let's say you have a bunch of debt you've got credit card debt you've got student loans you've got a mortgage and you've got a car loan um, let's say you hit financial troubles and you and you can't pay all your bills the first thing you're probably not going to pay is your you know your student loans or your credit cards those are those are one of the first things you're going to stop paying on there's no real ramifications to you um, if you stop paying those you don't lose anything uh, other than maybe your credit score uh, the the second to last thing that you're going to stop paying on is going to be your mortgage because if you stop paying your mortgage or you stop paying your rent you get evicted you get kicked out the bank takes your home whatever you don't have a place to live but financial uh, experts have always said that the car is the last thing you'll default on because you can live in your car and you can drive your car to work uh, you could live in your home, but you can't drive your home to work. And so other than the fact that there's, you know, a little bit more public transportation nowadays than there used to be, and there's things like Uber and Lyft, uh, maybe, you know, you're carpooling with a neighbor or something like that. Usually uh, they say you will default on your, uh, your mortgage or your rent before you uh, stop paying off your car loan uh, because you can live in your car, but you can't drive your home to work. And so they say that's the last thing to go. Well, auto loan um, uh, rates, auto, I'm sorry, auto loan uh, defaults have been growing at a very, very quick pace. And so that's particularly uh, a bad sign for the economy because if that is growing exponentially, that means people are really backed into corners. Now, it might not be as bad right now because the amount that people are spending on cars per their total income is way higher than it's ever been. The median income, household income in America right now is about $56,000. However, the uh, uh, average car loan right now is about $535 per month. So aside from how, you know, your rent or your mortgage, your car loan is your biggest expense if you're an average American. Now, this is a particularly bad sign, uh, really just because uh, nobody can really afford that. At some point, uh, you're, you're loading up on more debt each month, you're spending more than you're making. If, if, if your average uh, car loan out there is $535 per month, you really can't afford that. Most Americans don't have any savings at all. You're one missed paycheck away from going bankrupt. And so uh, if, you have, uh, if you have this kind of situation, you're probably not in a situation where you're gonna, um, you know, you're gonna let go of your home first because your car payment's so big, you know you really can't afford it anyway, so you might default on that and try and pick up a junker. So it might not be as bad from an overall economic standpoint other than the fact that we know car loans are being packaged up just like home loans were uh, 10 years ago and they're being sold as investments and so we don't know what the exposure of this is in the industry but we do know that these uh, collateralized uh, loan obligations collateralized debt obligations are uh, comprised of things like auto loans and student loans and corporate loans and they are invested in by um, pension funds by retirement accounts by corporations uh, and so um, it, it, it's only a matter of time to where we see if if the you know if the bubbles in these uh, loan pockets are big enough to actually create a bad uh, big dent or uh, create damage in the overall economy like the uh, package of home loans did. That brings us to the next bubble, which is the corporate loan bubble. So I mentioned that the auto loans are being packaged up, student loans are being packaged up and invested in. Uh, same thing with corporate loans, and again, it's debt. And so debt is right now governed by and manipulated by the Federal Reserve because they set the interest rates. So as they've been keeping the interest rates artificially low, it's been easy to get money. So corporations have been loading up on this debt. The big ones have been doing things like stock buybacks, uh, but the smaller corporations have been doing things like financing their operations with it. In a growing economy, the banks love that. Financial institutions love loaning money because it looks like, hey, small company, they're growing their revenue. Yes, they're operating at a loss, but uh, at, at least they're growing the revenue. They'll be able to pay it back as the economy grows and as they start to turn a profit once they capture a market share. So all these corporate loans are being packaged up and sold off to investors as well. And so as these loans turn bad, as the economy turns over, it's a reverse effect. Well, they won't be able to pay anymore. And so all of these packaged up loans by corporations, again, it's, it's an opaque market. So we don't know the extent and the depth to which these have penetrated things like pensions and retirement funds, but we know that they're out there. So 
the corporate loan bubble is real. There is a lot of corporate debt right now, more than there ever has been. And with consumer debt as well, consumer debt is at an all time high with credit card debt, student loans, auto loans. So debt overall, you can see a pattern here. Um, all of these bubbles are kind of finding the stock market bubble, the student loan bubble, auto loans, corporate loans, they're all financed by debt and debt is been has been made very easy to get over the last few years because interest rates have been kept artificially low by the Federal Reserve uh, printing money and keeping rates low and so we see a pattern here we see uh, kind of the source the man behind the curtain in all of these scenarios which um, is uh, kind of across the board here so this corporate bond bubble that kind of leads us to the uh, uh, to the IPO bubble and that's something you might not have heard a lot about recently, uh, but there's uh, kind of been a bubble popping right now, bursting in the IPO industry. So over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of disruptors. We've seen companies like Robinhood come in. They operate at massive losses, offer free or cheap products that nobody in the industry is able to offer, and they're financing it by investor money and cheap debt. And they're growing like crazy. Companies like Uber, did the same thing. Companies like Lyft did the same thing. Grubhub did the same thing. There's companies that are operating at massive losses. They're financing these losses with investor money. These investors are getting this money from the cheap money policy that's happening right now. All the easy money, the money printing, the cheap debt. And these companies are getting cheap debt. And so you have this kind of trifecta effect going on where there's you know all this new, easy, cheap money funneling into these companies. They're labeled as disruptors. And they're, oh, they're changing the industry. It's great. They're offering these free products, these cheap products. It's not real though. The market can't sustain that because if this company had to offer operate at a profit and wasn't surviving solely off of investors, money and debt, um, they would be operating at a loss. That means they go out of business. They don't have the, the, the market can't actually, because uh, if, the, if they were charging the same thing that everybody else charged, they wouldn't have any differentiation. Robin Hood wouldn't have been able to grow as fast as it did if it came in and it, and it asked for $5 commissions. The reason it grew is because it offered free trading. And so you had that, uh, you know, Robinhood come in and offer, you know, free trading, which nobody really was doing at the time. They disrupted the industry, but they're operating at a loss and they're operating based off of investors' money and debt. And so you have companies like now Schwab and TD Ameritrade have responded and now they're, they're commission free. And I would be shocked if Fidelity and E-Trade did not respond as well, offering free JP Morgan uh, about six months ago, maybe a year ago, they did the same thing. They offered you know similar semi-free product there for trading. And so you have these bigger companies that actually do operate at a profit uh, razor thin mar profit margins, but they still operate at a profit. And now that they're offering the same thing that some of these smaller companies did uh, by disrupting the market, it's going to be interesting to see how the how this plays out because companies like Grubhub, they're you know they're falling apart because there's competition now. Companies like um, uh, Uber and Lyft are falling apart as regulation comes in and they're not able to offer the same uh, type of pricing as they were before that got them all of the all of the uh, market because if if their if their product is only acceptable because it's free well at some point when they have to charge money for it the market is not going to want it as much and so uh, they, they can only really survive off of this investor money and debt and so once the market kind of turns around and people can't afford it in general anymore well then they're really in trouble so we see this happening with ipos right now we see this happening with WeWork and with there's a, a like a dental company it's called like smile direct or something like that um, we've seen a lot of these companies uh, recently that are uh, that are ipoing and their new companies they're operating at massive losses off of investor money and debt and it's only a matter of time before uh, that doesn't work anymore when that money dries up the market can't sustain those products at the uh, regular market prices which would be higher than they're charging right now and so um, it's uh, it's a destructive force to society it's not actually a wealth creation force uh, because it's financed by investor money and cheap debt and so again, the IPO bubble driven primarily the, 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 the original source by the Federal Reserve. 
That brings us to the last bubble that we're going to talk about today, which is the bond bubble and the government, specifically government debt, the national debt. It's grown, it grew by over a trillion dollars fiscal year 2019. August alone, it was a half a trillion, $450 billion. And so we're seeing the national debt skyrocket at an unprecedented pace. And it's not due to the tax cuts. That's what everybody's missing here. Tax revenue is actually up uh, before the, that, that from where it was before the tax cuts. The government is making more money on taxes than it used to, but the deficit is exploding. So it's due to spending. They're just they're making more money than they used to, but they're spending even more money than that. And so and we're seeing this massive explosion in spending by the U.S. government, and it's way more than they're making in taxes. And so what they have to do if they spend more than they make, debt. Just like an individual, if you spend more than you make in a month, you spent that on a credit card or some other form of debt. And so the US government has to do the exact same thing. Uh, it's no different than an individual. The way they take out debt though is by creating a treasury. That's just an IOU, it's just a government bond. It just says, hey, we're borrowing this money from whoever buys this bond from us. And so usually it's pensions, usually it's you know social security, usually it's retirement funds, usually it's central banks from around the world, and then financial institutions like banks have historically always loaded up on treasuries because the government will, the US government especially will always pay its debt back, right? And so the government has the US government has gotten away with this and has gotten reckless with this. So they're exploding the national debt at an unprecedented rate. However, over the last year, especially, uh, people have stopped buying treasuries. Uh, and when I say people, I mean net across the world, there has been a slowdown in purchases of US treasuries. So who is going to pick up uh, the slack when uh, central banks like China stopped uh, buying US treasuries? It's the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is going to be the buyer of last resort and soon it will be the only buyer of US treasuries because everyone is starting to realize that this train, this snowball that's uh, rolling down the hill is an avalanche and the US government can't stop its spending. Um, in fact, most of the financial numbers, the economic numbers are driven now by government spending when you dig into how they're calculated. And so uh, the government does not want to stop its spending because it will then look like the economy is actually slowing down, which it is. And so the only buyer left in the field is the Federal Reserve. Well, how does the Federal Reserve purchase treasuries? It prints money out of thin air. It creates money and it buys those treasuries. So it causes inflation because the money supply expands. So what happens then when uh, people, everyone stops buying treasuries and the Federal Reserve is the only buyer? People start selling their treasuries. Well, if, the, if in a free market, everyone starts selling something, the price goes down, right? But it's a treasury, so it has an interest rate associated with it. So if the price comes down, that means the yield goes up, the interest rate goes up. Well, if the interest rate on treasuries goes up, that means the government won't be able to afford to take out new debt to finance its spending. The Federal Reserve knows this, and so the Federal Reserve won't allow the price of treasuries to drop or else the government can't afford its spending uh, beyond its taxes. And so when prices start to come down for treasuries, the Federal Reserve will step in and they'll print billions or trillions of dollars in order to buy up all of the treasuries that are being sold off so that the price doesn't come down which would cause the interest rates to go up. They want to keep interest rates low, and so they're going to print money to buy treasuries to do this. Well, what happens when they start printing these trillions of dollars to be the only buyer of all these treasuries that are being sold? Well, when countries and central banks start selling their treasuries, they're going to get dollars back for them from the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve is the only one buying them. Well, the only thing worse than a US treasury in this scenario is a US dollar because at least a treasury has an interest rate associated with it. The US dollar doesn't. And so the only thing you would like to do with that dollar then is to get rid of it. 
Well, if everyone's dumping treasuries, certainly no one's gonna want dollars. So you're not gonna go to China and spend a US dollar. You're not gonna go to Germany and spend a US dollar. You're not gonna go to Brazil and spend a US dollar. The only place you're going to be able to spend the US dollar in return for something is going to be the United States. Specifically because in the United States, citizens by law are required to use the US dollar as legal tender. And so the only way to get rid of their US dollars around the world, they will have to buy products from the United States. Again, they won't be able to go to anybody else in the world to get rid of their dollars because nobody wants dollars. But in the US, they're legally required to accept dollars as legal tender. So they'll have to buy products from the United States from citizens in the US in order to get rid of their dollars. So what is going to happen when all these dollars that have been created by the Fed to purchase uh, US treasuries come flooding back to the United States? All of the prices will skyrocket. Because the world is trying to get rid of dollars, there will be a fire sale on dollars, they'll have to purchase US products, and US uh, taxpayers are the only ones who are gonna be left legally having to foot the bill. And so when the world tries to get rid of their dollars and buy everything from the United States, there will be a race to get rid of the dollars. And so they'll be bidding up the prices of goods and services, products that are in America, in order to dump the dollar. They would rather have our products instead. Our grocery store shelves will be empty, our department stores will be empty, our factories will be empty. And as the dollar crashes and as the costs of our own goods and services go up, we will no longer be able to afford goods and services from around the world anymore. Right now, everything around the world seems cheap compared to the US dollar. That will not be the case anymore. So the Federal Reserve is the man behind the curtain in all of this. They've inflated all of these different asset bubbles and they've gotten themselves into kind of in between a rock and a hard place. As the recession kicks into gear, uh, these asset bubbles are going to start to pop one after another. And as these asset bubbles, these prices come down, uh, we're going to see this effect start to take, start to kick in faster and faster. The only tool the Federal Reserve has uh, in order to keep the economy on track is printing money and lowering interest rates. That's the exact same tool that created all these asset bubbles and got us into this predicament in the first place. At this point in the cycle, printing more money, lowering rates even further. Ray Dalio always says it's like pushing on a string. It's just ineffective. It doesn't work to push the economy forward anymore. Even though you're doing the same thing that got you to this point, it just becomes ineffective. So the mechanism that is supposed to help the economy has really just created all of these bubbles. And as the wealth effect starts to reverse, once the recession kicks into gear, we're gonna see all these bubbles start to pop. And that's going to lead to the ultimate bubble popping of the US national debt. This means we are going to enter into an inflationary depression. Last time there was a depression, it was a deflationary depression. This time it's going to be an inflationary depression. So watch for these asset bubbles to start popping as you see these asset prices start to fall. That's going to be an indication that things are starting to turn over in addition to the data we're already starting to see, like manufacturing data starting to look bad, especially as global trade tensions rise and other uh, sources that could start popping these bubbles start to pop up uh, throughout the world and the economy. Keep an eye out. Please leave your questions and your comments uh, below. If anything that I've said today doesn't make sense, if you have questions, or even if you disagree and you want to have a conversation about it, let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And please, like and subscribe and share this video if you did like the content. Help a small channel out. I really appreciate you watching and uh, you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the content. I try and put out as much content as I can, especially whenever there is something new happening in the market. Please like and subscribe. And if you want more, if you need a step-by-step -step plan in order to prepare for the coming financial crash, I did write a book. It is on Amazon. You can buy the Kindle version or the paperback. It's called Financial Heresy. You can also find it on my website at heresy.financial, but it's easiest if you just go to Amazon. You can again get the Kindle or the paperback. It's called Financial Heresy. Thank you so much again for watching. Please like and subscribe and share. You guys have a great day.